Hello and welcome to the Bulletin Blog. I'm Helen McGraw, Executive Director of Policy and Governance at LLG, and I'm joined today by guest contributor John Austin, who's the chair of ADSO. Welcome, John. Hi, Helen. Thank you very much for inviting me. No problem. We should probably just say, actually, that ADSO stands for the Association of Democratic Services Officers. It does. Yes. Um, now it's election week, and that means a very busy time for both our members, John, but I would say that Democratic services are very likely to have far more far more involvement than most other lo local government departments. So how are your members in the run up to these elections? Any particular concerns? Oh, well, it's always a busy and a stressful time, Helen, isn't it? You know, yeah. I worked on elections for many, many years and there's so much to do in such a relatively short space of time. Um, this year... We've got different elections taking place. You've got the uh, the um, obviously the council elections. You've got the mayoral elections. Mm -hmm. You've got the PCP elections, um, and it just makes it that much more complicated. Yeah. Um, and certainly, democratic services uh, staff will be supporting th their election colleagues in many ways, and in fact, an increasing number of Democratic services officers now are uh, twin hatted and will have election duties yep. as part of their uh, formal role. Um, voter ID was a big issue um, last time, wasn't it? And I think that was handled well. I think there were there were a lot less um, people not able to vote than was first thought. Um, postal votes uh, increasing um, significantly yeah. and in fact they're almost an election on their own now postal votes they have to be managed separately um, and it is becoming I think more uh, demanding and councils are having to put more and more resources into postal votes including those that are delivered to polling stations on the day and I can never understand why people ask for polling, ask for a postal vote, and then take it to the yeah. polling station on the day. It, it's just beyond me, but that's what happens. And, and and obviously they have to be processed quite late in the day. Uh, so you'll often find that they're being opened at the same time as the rest of the counts going on. So, uh, but yeah, I, I can't understand the logic of that. But we're, as you say, we're, we're um, election tomorrow um i used to always breathe a little sigh of relief at this at uh, this uh stage because all the all of the, the boxes have gone out yeah the hard know, work the them, yeah. and they're now with the presiding officers and it's now over to them and it's now over to the staff isn't it to run the polling station properly and um you know councillors will have done all the training they provide all the support but you are relying on presiding officers and and the polling staff doing their jobs properly on the day. So yeah, busy time for everyone. And then of course, once the election's done, it's then on to the count, yes. which is the next stage. So pressurised, stressful time. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think it's fair to say that local authorities do an incredible job of the of unbelievable. In fact, when you step back and really look at the machinery of it. Um, and the and, you know and the consistent delivery it's it's all hats off to everybody it's an amazing job that that they do i think our sort of colleagues in the aa um who obviously um do this full time amazing job as you say yeah. so, so much pressure at at, the, at this time so much pressure and they do an amazing job and it never it, it always amazed me at their resilience and stamina and you know their their ability to cope with the many changes, the many challenges that the government and the electoral commission throw their way, but they always get the job done, and I think with the support of our members as well. So it's amazing, and I think it's often under undervalued and underestimated just what a great uh, a great um, thing they do. Yeah. So yeah, I couldn't great. agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, now let's 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 move on to one of our bugbears, John. It's something we've been talking about for a really long period, and we're still not well. We're not any further forward in relation to it, and that's remote 
meeting provision for local authority. Yeah. It's been, well, we're now over three years since the judicial review and uh, the call for evidence that came out from the government was contemporaneous um, at that time as well. We still haven't seen the outcome of that call for evidence. We don't know anything about it. We tried, didn't we, to to force the government's hand to release that information in the form of an FOI request. And we didn't, we didn't get anywhere mm. there either, did we? No, we didn't. Um, I think I would agree with you when you say we're no further on in terms of getting the resolution that we want. Mm. But I think we're much further on in raising it as an issue in the sort of uh, campaigns that we ran, in people's awareness, and also people seeing the wider benefit of yeah. remote meetings beyond what was initially the reason, which was COVID. So I, I, I think we've moved the agenda on without, you're right, getting the resolution that we wanted. But we've not, you know, we've not abandoned it, have we? I think yeah. we realised that it was probably unproductive to try and bang your head against the same brick wall uh, with, with the other uh, government. They they had an opportunity in the Leveling Up Bill and they didn't take that. So there, they had two opportunities. <laughs> they had two, yeah, Why is the House of Lords moved? So there's no way that they were going to change their mind. So yeah. I think basically, you know, we've got to hope that any new uh, uh, administration after the general election sees remote meetings in a different light. But I, I, I do have to say that I was amazed and surprised at the decision of the ICO in regards to the call for evidence, in not to request the government to publish. And, and I would never accuse the ICO of being in the sort of pockets of the ministers. They're not, I know. But the, the, their decision no. and their reasoning for that just defied logic to me, and it was blatantly wrong. And it certainly wasn't in the public interest. It, well, it, the, it really surprised me. I mean, the determination, and obviously they, they would say that they're working within their legislative framework and and with autonomy and, um, you know, that, that has to be right. But they, they, they acknowledged that it was in the public interest. I think that's important first thing mm. to state. They acknowledged it was in the public interest to release, release this information, but it seemed to me that, I mean, ostensibly the rejection came from the fact that it would take far too much time and far too many resources in order to um, take all the various forms of information that had been submitted, because there was a lot, can't recall the exact figure, um, and 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 produce something tangible from that in, in one sort of data set uh, to be able to release the information. But sort of why, what I would say, why, first of all, why call, go out for a call for evidence if you don't okay. then intend to, to you know, investigate the contributions that have come in relation to it. And um, the other thing that the ICO did in their judgment was to say, well, look, the government have pledged to release this. Now, yeah. when? If there's no yeah. time on that, how, yeah, no, I, I would question how that is open governance. I agree. I agree. And I just think you're right that um, the government launched this call for evidence themselves. Um, I think the I think the response the number of responses is well over four thousand. I think well, I might be wrong there. And then all of a sudden they think, oh, it's too big to handle. Well, they're huge resources that they must be used to dealing with consultation exercises that are much larger than this. My my sort of cynical view, um, and I, I don't think. We can be blamed for being cynical after such a long wait for the information to be published. Is that they saw overwhelmingly that the results were not what they wanted? I believe that, and they've been uh, prevaricating ever since and uh, are delaying, and they don't intend publishing the information. They're certainly not going to publish it between now and the election, anyway. Oh, aren't yeah. they? So, um, yeah. I just think the outcome was not what they wanted and therefore they're trying to kick it down the road it's a I cynical mean, view i know but well i think i mean i suppose the good news is that that information does exist and it's unlikely to have changed even in this in this time in fact it might even be stronger now i don't mm. i mean we don't know 
But at yeah. least, you know, we have to wait and see the outcome of the election and we have to wait and see if there's a change of an administration. But if there's an appetite, then whoever, you know, holds the power in the future yeah. at least has that information to hand. It doesn't, you know, necessarily need to, to re-engage. Although the longer it, it goes on, the more it would have to. Yeah, I, I think it's important that we emphasise to you know to your members and to ourselves members that we've not forgotten about it and we're not no. giving it up it, it's just the pause for, for the reasons that i said earlier on and actually you made a really good point earlier it's really important for people to know that we didn't just take the judicial review and an foi and sit there we've done nothing else we've worked extensively um between ourselves and also you know we have to acknowledge other other organizations that were also in the mix throughout um now can an SLC in particular in terms mm. of, of of trying to bring bring Absolutely. about statutory provision yeah. and we you know we have been consistent throughout all this time and um we'll simply continue to be so it's not I'm, absolutely I'm on it. absolutely and you know what it's the one issue certainly in recent times that has galvanized the, the various so organisations uh, and and has united them. You mentioned SLC and now LGA. Similarly, it's brought us all together, and we and we sort of galvanised behind the one banner, which I think was great. And I think that has has had a knock on effect as well. Yeah. In relation to partnership working in other areas as well. So I think it, you know, there's a lot of sort of positives come out of this. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. You know. So. I think it's it's been well worth it. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And sector representatives have come together. Organisations have come together and yeah. build a, you know built and forged relationships, which are now advent advantageous for other work that we're doing. Absolutely, so that's great. I that's agree. Great. Yeah. Now, um, obviously, there is an interplay between legal services and democratic services. Their work, you know, really does. Um, because we're in the we're in the business of governance, aren't we? Yeah, um, yeah. Essentially, we yeah. all have a part to play in governance. And actually, Rachel McCoy cons consistently says, "Governance is is just not for leaders; it's for everybody." You know, Absolutely. everyone needs to be yeah. thinking in that mind space. So, Absolutely. you know, how what do you think the benefits are? How well, firstly, how can legal and democratic services work more effectively together to bring about um, benefits from that to the local authority? I think it. I think it sort of stems from the top, and I think the way ADSO and LLG work well together can cascade down. I think we can lead by example. Yeah. I think if you think about it, the relationship and the working uh, re arrangements between legal and democratic services will vary depending on each council. For for example. The uh, the lawyers in some councils will have much more involvement in in the governance processes than in others. I think that I, I think that's a fact. So it, it it is it's a lot harder for those lawyers who are m more detached from the governance process because of the way structures work within their councils to engage with sort of democratic services. But those that are, are more engaged, um, I've seen some really good examples of working together in the constitution, managing the constitution, changing the constitution. Yes. Uh, and it's related processes. Um, and also around meetings, because we know, don't we, that some lawyers, well, lawyers will go to planning, they will go to licensing, probably cabinet, um, it, it may vary at sort of council as to who who sits next to the mayor, but th there are there are a whole host of opportunities there are for more sort of joint working. So it, it will vary depending on the council in terms of the closeness of that relationship, but um, certainly around those sort of governance processes, there's a lot of commonality in in in, the, in their roles. And I think I think it is important for particularly those lawyers who want to move on maybe move in a in a way outside of the law to get into more leadership more sort of management uh, positions and I, I i sort of said this on the inspire module that i i uh, i did last week that um familiarizing yourself 
with democratic services, how it works and, and the governance processes can give people such a solid foundation for moving on into other roles within the organization. I agree. The um, so, yeah, there are a whole host of ways that that we can work more uh, collaboratively with the lawyers. Uh, but it will depend, as I say, on the structural arrangements within the councils. Yeah. Well, I but always... certainly, I'd so an LLG can lead the way. Yeah, I agree with that. And I always think it's really important for junior lawyers or those coming into the into local authority from private practice to get an understanding of what it is democratic services do and how that's important to the effective governance of the organization because of course as we know local authorities are a completely different animal and they can really benefit as you've said from understanding that now i i had ed hammond from the center for governance and scrutiny as you know on the podcast this week and we were talking about scrutiny and really the now actually there are some brilliant examples of good practice within local authorities as there always are but there is this sort of rolling theme certainly within authorities that have been seen to fail about simply playing lip service to scrutiny and or potentially not utilizing it in the best way in the way in which it was designed for um you know what's your view in relation to the importance of scrutiny in local government I worked with scrutiny for many years and I, and it was very successful. So, so I've got a lot of time for scrutiny. I, I've seen how it can work well, um, but it can only work well with the support of the full council, of the whole council. And I think and I think at, at the end of the day, Helen, isn't it, 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 it's the executive that, de that decides how its scrutiny function will work, whether it, whether it values scrutiny, whether it supports scrutiny and whether it resources it properly. Um, do you know, I wonder whether it's time to have a a relook at at scrutiny, at the role and its purpose. It's over 20 years old now, isn't it? Mm. Um, is it 20 years old? Yeah, 2000, isn't it? Well, it's still very much younger than the Local Government Act. So it <laughs> is, but... but oh, no, you're right, you're right. But, 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 you know, so much has changed in, in the local government world since yeah. then. And probably across most councils the resources that are available to scrutiny have been reduced i would guess mm. so my sort of my sort of point is or sort of question is are we expecting too much of scrutiny you're right that when anything goes wrong one of the first questions people ask is well, where is where is scrutiny and yet, it, it, it's far less resource now than it ever was. So I wonder whether we need to have another look at it, refresh its role and purpose and say, you know, how should it work? How should it be resourced in the modern world? Now, I know not everyone will agree with that, but I just think the expectations are sometimes too high. And scrutiny at times is trying to spread itself too thinly. Um, yeah, and that's when that's when the gaps appear. I don't know. That's my view, anyway. Well, I think, I mean, there could be an opportunity. I mean, obviously, the sector's starting to talk about an audit crisis, and I think there's something. Well, there's some potential, isn't there, in relation to performance and audit to to potentially scoop up scrutiny and take a look at that within that whole sort of uh, genre, because I know that I was saying to Ed that Simon Hoare, the minister, sort of ruled out giving audit to Offlog and was thinking about putting it into this 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 other entity, um, Arga, I believe it's called, um, but that nothing's going to happen anyhow before, uh, well, within this parliament. And I just think maybe if, if the government's going to look at audit, it might want to take a look at scrutiny at the same time. Yeah, but yeah, but they're two different things, aren't they? They are. You know, they and, are, and they're often confused. They're often confused, or the, or or they're often intertwined, and that's wrong. They are different functions, um, and I think scrutiny can be much more creative, much more flexible, much more 
um, engage with the people that actually use the services, but also the people that provide the services. And I think, I think it, it, it's wrong to try, and I'm not saying you are or we are, but I, I think, you know, the likes of the minister, it, it, it's wrong to try and uh, conflate the two. I just think they are separate, totally separate, totally different cultures, different ways of working, or sh sh should be anyway. Mm. Um, I, I and I get a bit irritated when people look to, you know, look to link the two and possibly merge the two. Well, I, I certainly don't suggest they merge the two because, like you, no, are, no, I, 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 I very don't think much you think, are, no. but I, I just think it's 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 about creating opportunities in parliamentary time to to take a look at the local government sector because yeah 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 because yeah. it really I mean the whole as you know as you know we've spoken about on many occasions the the whole legislative framework for local government is just in desperate need of revamping and bringing into you know the the what, I hate the expression modern well but um, at least everybody knows what I mean when I say it because it's really really old now and it's not doing what it what it needs to do but well, um, absolutely so uh, finally, John, I just want to talk to you a little bit about recruitment and retention into the sector, because I know that there's a massive issue with recruitment and retention ac across most government departments and that local government departments. Um, there's particular crisis in planning and social care, but, but legals in the mix as well. Um, are there recruitment and retention problems within democratic services? Absolutely. Yeah. We're no different, mm. Ellen. Um Councils have problems attracting and retaining staff. You've only got to look at London. It's so competitive, isn't it, for yeah. for recruitment? Uh, but in other parts of the country uh, as well. And I think I think it, it is pleasing to see um, some trainee uh, positions coming up in democratic services. Liverpool have just advertised for an apprentice democratic right. services officer, which is great. Um, I'm a greater believer in in, in, in those roles, um, and I think it is uh, right to look to uh, grow your own. I, I'm a believer in that, um, so I think councils have to devote time and energy into into that route. Um, and I, I, I think there is a role for ADSO and LLG to promote their sectors as, mm -hmm. you know, great places to work. And I know LLG do a lot of work on that. And it's something that I aspire for ADSO, uh, you know, to be able to go out and have the resources to go out and get into the universities and into other, other, other places promoting the sector. We've done it a little bit, but it's something that is on our sort of list when we when we have the resources so it is about i think providing as many opportunities for people to come into the sector and sort of grow your own um and and also maybe and i know this is less easy in in, in the legal sector probably because of the you know the sort of nature of your qualifications and and, and the and, and the law society but I think probably placing more emphasis on potential rather than experience mm. and on sort of qualifications. Um, I think we've got to be more creative, more inventive uh, with, our, our, you know, with our, our recruitment in the areas that we look to bring people in from. So, yeah, we're no different from any other sector in that regard, Helen. Well, one of the things LLG does quite successfully, uh, has done for the last three years, is its work experience week. Yeah. Um, and that's about going into, you know, you know, well, forging ties with the universities and getting them to 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 yeah. flag up this. Yeah, thing. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and it's quite a good model because it's online sessions in the in the afternoon, but in the morning you're paired with the local authority. Um, so that and it, because as we again, students very rarely know about local government, what local government yeah. is and what it does. They've just got no comprehension of that, and then once yeah. they, once they do, their their eyes are eyes are open and in fact we had an intern once um who who, who went off and went to work at democratic services yes and, yeah um, yeah 
remarkable, yes. remarkable yeah, industry, absolutely. individual. I won't name her. Um, but yes, yeah, really, yeah. yeah. I, know, I know exactly who you mean. Future and we're very leader. pleased to have her. <laughs> Future leader. So we but love it. One of the things that we did, Helen, was, uh, 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 and we do, we provide a year's free membership to students. If they come to us and say, I I'm, I'm interested in local government or in democratic services, which we don't get that many, but we have had a few. We provide them with a year's free membership well, and they can go, uh, they can attend the regional meetings. And we actually had one one success where somebody came and we we gave them the year's free membership. I sort of took him out to some of the regional meetings. It was all virtual, so it was easy to do. Introduced him and he attended some of the meetings that, that then offers at own back. He, he then got an <laughs> internship. He then got a temporary role, and the last time I checked, which was a year or so back, he had a full-time role yeah. in sort of democratic services. I don't know whether he, he's still there, but, you know, we, it's things like that that I think we sort of could be doing more of. Yeah, yeah, and and, and a success story is always a lovely thing as well. Absolutely, Ab absolutely, yeah. yeah. So it's not, good to finish on a high. So thank absolutely, you. yeah, yeah. Thank you ever so much for joining me today, John, always. You're lovely. welcome. Enjoyed it. Thank That's you lovely. very much. Now, for, thank you. Now, for viewers, next week, I'm sure you'll be delighted to learn that Dennis will be making a return to both the vlog and the podcast. So please do take time to listen to the LRG Grapevine podcast this week, where I talk to Ed Hammond, um, as I've said, for the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny. And on that note, I wish you all the very best with the elections process. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.